says he thinks that you're smart in math and smart in science. They assume that you're a genius. Excuse me. Being smart in math and science gives you a reputation of being a genius in every subject there is. So I was thought of as the bright one in my school. Well, I, I always had this idea that I was going to improve life in people's homes and someday be an engineer. I read books. I read books about a young engineer who owned a company with his own father. When there was a world disaster or a catastrophe, he would go into the laboratory and maybe work for weeks and disappear. And when he came out, he had some invention that was going to solve the crisis. And I just admired that. I thought, wow, I want to be one of those engineers that goes into the laboratory and builds something good for people. I enjoyed going down to my father and seeing where he worked and how he hooked circuits together and made diagrams on screens. And, and I sort of admired that. But my father never pushed myself or my siblings to be engineers. I was the only one that became an engineer like my father did. When I was young, the early music device in 1960 was the transistor radio. By 1980, we had the Walkman. By 2000, it's like every 20 years, by 2000, we had the iPod. Well, I had my little transistor radio, and it was like one of the best devices I would have to this day in my life. I could sleep, listen to music all night long, and I loved it. My father worked for the military, and he was close to the early chip companies. Chips are made of silicon. Chips are what drive our computers to this day. And the early chip companies were starting up in where we lived at that time, which was Silicon Valley. And my father was close to those companies, and he started telling me how they were going to put six transistors on one small piece of silicon. Six transistors, not just one. And wow, I said, now I'm going to have a better transistor radio, right? And he said, oh, no, 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 no. They developed the new technologies for the military, for the government, for the big, huge corporations that can afford it. But little people in their home, normal people, can never afford the new technologies. And I didn't like that. I always hope that someday the appliances that we have in our very homes would drive the companies to develop the state of art of the new technologies. And looking back, I can see that that's what's happened. The computers are driving the forces to make the greatest microprocessors and memory chips. And the largest chips in the world, the most processing in the world on silicon, is actually done now for game machines. So we've made a big transition in what drives technology forward. It's consumer appliances. When I was very young, I became a ham radio operator, and in those days, electronic equipment was often sold as kits. You could buy a hi-fi, pre-built, but usually you bought what was called a heath kit, a set of parts, and you, you jumbled out the parts with instructions of how to assemble them, you screwed things together and connected them and soldered wires and put all the transistors and vacuum tubes in place, and hopefully if you did everything right, it worked. And that's one of the natures of technology, of engineering, of math, which is you have to do almost everything perfectly where there's an error, there's a bug. Anyway, building these projects myself was a very good start in life because it gave me a lot of appreciation for the fact that good, deserving projects, important things in life, take a long time. They just aren't done overnight. They aren't done in a flash, and it helps to build a large project, something worthwhile that you can show to other people. It's a type of learning on your own when you build something that is much more important than learning from books. If you're building something for yourself, something you're going to use in your personal life, or maybe you're just modifying a car, whatever you're doing, it's going to be so perfect. In early age, I was able to come across some transistors before almost any other kids could touch these magical parts that were parts of computers. And I, I learned that a transistor is a decision maker. It can decide yes or no, just like a remote control. Push a button and something happens. That's pretty much how a transistor works. I came across a journal by total accident. Almost everything good in my life that led up to Apple Computer was accident after accident after accident. Just discoveries of things that I found interesting in life. And I 
found a journal that described computers. And back in those days, you never thought you'd ever see a computer in your life. They were huge, multi-million dollar monstrosities that the government had and research had, but you'd never really seen one yourself. And in that manual, I discovered it, it taught the, the arithmetic of ones and zeros, binary, the language of computers, the logic of computers. Well, I took a bunch of transistors, and for an early science fair project, when I was only 10 years old, on a big, huge piece of plywood, I nailed in nails as connectors and soldered transistors and diodes and resistors, and made a huge, huge device for that young and age that would play tic-tac-toe and not lose. And tic-tac-toe is a set of rules. If you look where the players have made their moves, you can adequately choose where you're going to move. So, when I needed help, like I would ask my dad, how do atoms work? And he would explain the nature of an atom and electrons. And I would ask, how do wires work? And how do transistors work? He was always there to explain as a good teacher. And he told me that your teachers are the most important people in your life. That where you go, the salary you make, how good a life you have, the family you have, the home you have, everything really depends upon how much you learn. The more you learn, the better you're going to do. So, I didn't know that these little projects for school that I was working on, well, they were huge. They were like the equivalent of large engineering projects that much older people who worked as engineers for salaries and companies would do. I didn't know that. I just did it for fun. You know, there's different kinds of rewards in life. The sort of reward you get when you work, when you're in school, is a good grade or a math award or commendation from a teacher. The sort of award you get when you work is a higher salary or a job title, a promotion, a raise, your houses, how many yachts you have. Those are physical awards that everyone can see, including your clothing. But there's other types of rewards that are more important. Those are the rewards that are only inside of our brains. The reward that knows I've done something I want to do in life. It doesn't matter how important it is, how useful it is to the world, it's what I love doing. And computers became my internal reward. I was going to love and work towards computers and work towards designing them my entire life, even though I didn't think there were any jobs in computers. I felt that engineers designed things like televisions, radios, guidance systems for SAF or missiles, that sort of thing. I didn't think that, that engineers would design computers or that I would ever get to work in computers, but I would do it as my fun hobby, as a pastime, as the thing that you'll do when nobody's paying you a cent to do it. In high school, I was very fortunate to have an electronics teacher that saw beyond the school boundaries. Normally, in a school, you are told the education and what you will learn is in the boundaries of the school. It is in our books. It is in our teachers. But this one teacher, every year, would take a couple of students that were outstanding, and he recognized that I already knew all the electronics by then in school. He took those students and got them to go into local companies and work with real engineers. I admire that highly. I have even encountered colleges, universities in the United States that work that way, where you go to the university for six months and you have a job for six months. There are companies that give jobs to all the students, and then you go to school for six months and a job for six months. And it's called a co-op system, and you get the best of both worlds. You learn the textbook academics of how to solve problems, but you also get to see how real companies work and what their real problems are like and how to deal with other people when you work. So I got to go down to this company and program a computer. I thought, oh my God, nobody even touches a computer in that time and age. I get to program a computer. A computer is power. It does a million things a second. A human being could only count about one number a second, but a computer can count a million numbers in one second. This made me feel, I was very shy by this point in time. I didn't normally talk to people, but I liked the feeling of, of power, of excitement, of the new things. What was exciting in the world? So I went down and one of my first programs was a chess problem. And it's a well-known chess problem called the Knight's Tour, where the knight has to hit every chair, every square on the chess board.